Hi, Mary and Charles. Nice to see you here. Okay, so let's let's start. Well, hello everyone. Um, my name is Angelo Amoya, Head of Sales at Connections Luxury. And I would like to welcome you to our Connect Talks, uh, Luxury Trends, Connecting with Existing and Emerging Demographics with Mike Gallinari, all the way from Chicago. For all of our Connections Luxury members and to all of our friends from around the world, a warm welcome to you. As you know, Connections Luxury is an international private community for trusted decision makers in high-end travel. Everything we do is specifically designed in the Connections way of doing business, which is a pioneering networking concept, combining one-to-one -one meetings with memorable experiences to forge long-lasting business relationships. So I encourage you all to get involved and have your cameras on, if you can, ready to discover the person behind the professional role. Before I introduce today's guest, I wanted to mention that today I am joined by my colleagues Jess from Operations and Pam from Marketing. We will be sharing information, spotlighting our session, and we'll be interacting with you in the chat. Please, can I ask you all to place yourself on mute? This session will last up to an hour and it's been recorded. So if you have colleagues or friends who might find this Connect Talks useful, we will be distributing in the, com in the coming days. If during the talk you have any questions, please do not hesitate to pop them in the chat box. So let's begin. In this Connect Talks sessions, we will be talking about a very hot subject, the next big trend in luxury travel. Travelers are redefining value in post-pandemic trips, aligning them with personal preferences. Mike Alinari of Mintel shares how to reach professionals of both high net worth and growing luxury interested travel segments, with Bahrain as the main case study. Mike, over to you. Thank you, Angelo. Um, and thank you for to Connections for having me speak. Um, Oops, uh, I just wanna make sure everyone can see the title slide uh, here for Luxury Trends. Um, the goal here is, uh, as Angelo said, I'm gonna be going over some of the uh, emerging trends that we're seeing, not only in uh, the sort of high net worth populations, but also people who are maybe in that, uh, in income levels and, and net worth levels below that, who are expressing interest in luxury travel and are actually uh, and actually have been for several years. To start with, um, just a few terms that I'll be using. Um, a luxury trip is uh, a trip that involves any one facet of luxury um, that we had uh, listed out in our surveys when we were talking to talking to survey goers or survey takers rather. Um, the gen pop I'll be using a lot. That's just a, a statistically representative cross-section of uh, American adult consumers and high net worth, uh, AHNW here, that's the uh, high net worth population that we've tagged of uh, personal net worth of 500,000 or above. Broadly, uh, we found that the demand for luxury travel has remained steady, not only among the typical luxury high net worth market, but also among the general population. And in fact, Two thirds of under 35s in that 75,000 USD household income uh, intended to take a luxury trip in 2023, which is pretty, um, that is pretty outstanding. Uh, it, that's been growing. Uh, it's, it's very interesting among, among millennials and Gen Z, but the overall trend uh, has been a, a growing or solid uh, inclination toward luxury travel among the general population, even despite uh, high inflation. Demographically, um, some of the broad movements that we've seen just in the last year is that the general population tends to be younger than high net worth uh, travelers. Um, they're also more ethnically and racially diverse. They tend to live more in cities, which uh, provides different targeting and marketing opportunities than rural or suburban. And they're more likely to have families, which also opens up the opportunities for family luxury options. 
um, moving over to the to the high net worth, generally they're um, they're over they're sorry older overall uh, compared to the gen pop, but within that segment they are getting younger. So that does op open opportunities, say in more active, um, maybe the sort of adventure or adventure adjacent travel. Within the general population, we identified a segment uh, that is particularly engaged, uh, hence the name, uh, in luxury travel. And demographically, they tend to be dads living in cities, inter-approaching middle age too. So this is giving you an idea of who you're sort of, the, the audience that is most looking for luxury travel messaging, luxury travel information, and being presented options. Um, when we talk about what they're doing as far as planning luxury travel, uh, a lot of times they're looking to improve a certain aspect of travel. So um, the example I like to give is they might stay at a luxury resort uh, for their for their trip, but they might take a low class or a, a low class carrier, low fare carrier to get there, something like Ryanair or Wizard Air or here in the States, something like Frontier or Spirit. When we look at motivations, generally luxury travel motivations are the same among the two populations, but we do see a bit more emphasis on relaxation among the general population. So this idea of pampering, of indulgence resonates a little bit more with the gen pop, whereas high net worth um, are more focused on creating lasting memories. And this is congruent with trends that we've seen in family travel, whereas older uh, family travelers are looking to connect with their traveling parties more. So bringing grandkids along and doing things that will create memories. So that's taking a bit more precedence here than, than the relaxation aspect for high net worth. When we look at the destinations that are of most interest, again, we're looking at kind of the same big hits, but going along with that idea of making memories, uh, multi-stop tours for luxury travel, the high net worth luxury travelers um, are much more of an interest uh, as, as sort of a facilitator for making those memories. Whereas in the gen pop, we see beach destinations, again, facilitating their goals of relaxation, pampering, the sort of idea of paradise um, that uh, a lot of them kind of have. Broadly, um, looking forward into 2024, uh, Mintel has identified several trends that affect uh, consumers globally. And we feel that are sort of universal in the in motivations and how consumers buy and think. Um, when we look at it in terms of luxury travel among gem pop and high net worth, um, this idea of value is very important. Um, and there are things beyond the, the monetary investment that, uh, that go into value. It's just one part of the picture. Um, quality is a big part of that. And in, ex in experiences, quality a lot of times means connecting what they're doing with their motivations and their outlook on life. Um, that includes things like sustainability, convenience, and, and emotions uh, built into the experience. With that in mind, um, we're finding that sustainability matters to the gen pop luxury travelers um, even more, and it's it just increasing as, as the years go on. They come to su expect sustainability, and they are, excuse me, coming in with the impression that luxury providers are more sustainable and are able to deliver on their sustainability expectations. So, you know, this isn't as much of a, um, of a demand among high net worth. But when you get into sort of this crossover uh, market, there is a higher demand and a higher expectation for that. Um, moving into what the role of advisors are, um, that there is a lot of trust, especially among the general population, but also among high net worth travelers about the, uh, the ex expertise that travelers have. Um, but especially... Um, uh, you know, especially among the high net worth, there's a reticence to uh, hire an advisor. So advisors have this this sort of need to um, help these travelers navigate their concerns, which include safety and fear of the unknown, um, but also just simple navigation of the destination and what activities are there. 
um, kind of really lifting the veil on everything that this destination has to offer. And, you know, in oftentimes it's, it's, it's not as scary or unsafe or different than people might think. Uh, going back to that extravagantly engaged segment of the general population, um, when we look at what they're looking for, uh, or sorry, where their their inspiration lies, it's very reliant on social media, um, which means that basically they're they're going to social media to find out this information, which can be an issue for brands and travel advisors because there's a lot of misinformation, subpar information, especially in the luxury sphere. Um, so we have these really engaged people that really want to travel uh, and travel luxury, but they may not be getting the best information. Um, advisors thus need this really robust uh, presence on social media in order to be that authoritative voice that these travelers really need uh, more so than we want even. They need this because of the, the wealth of information and misinformation that's out there. Um, and as Angela mentioned, we have a case study of, uh, of Bahrain among American um, consumers, uh, people who are intending to travel uh, to travel abroad. Um, so we we just sort of did this kind of to get a, a heat check on how Bahrain stopped, uh, stacks up to uh, other GCC destinations. Um, the impressions of Bahrain in particular is um, really a lot of, uh, they don't know a lot about the destination. Um, you know, as we see like 40% don't really have a, a, a an impression of the country going in as, as a luxury destination. So um, there is really an opportunity here because the country isn't necessarily known for anything. It can define itself however it wants to, um, which gives uh, advisors, DMOs, brands, a lot of flexibility in uh, tailoring how they present the destination to each particular segment or down to particular client that they're, that they're going after. Um, what, uh, there's sort of uh, more standouts as well of, of, uh, what they have to offer, um, that, uh, very similar here. Um, and again, the, the message here is that it's got something for everyone. The country does, um, also none of these was very high. Uh, so there's that, again, that idea of, um, it's, it's for you to discover really as a traveler and that's for both the general population and, and high net worth um but education of of bahrain as a as a destination is really key here uh we looked at how bahrain and the other gcc countries stack up against each other um and here we've seen that um the emirates and and qatar's efforts lately have really um, paid off as far as knowledge and and impressions uh, among americans about the country um, whereas places that are less known bahrain and, Om and oman um really have to kind of catch up if they want to compete with with here the heavy hitters being the uae and, and especially and qatar um and this is that was for the gem pop. This is for the high net worth. Similar things here. Um, we see UAE and Qatar standing out. Um, but uh, the real standout here is Bahrain is considered the most difficult to navigate among these countries. So that is a, a focus area that um, advisors, TMOs, what have you, um, can start from uh, in order to uh, in order to attract more people. And I think that the 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 global the the regional visa program that's coming out in the next couple of years. I think that that'll be a real help um, as well as sort of cross uh, cooperation uh, between these countries here on the, on the peninsula will really help. Uh, and that is, uh, that's me. I believe we're right at about time. So thank you very much. And I believe I'll hand it back for breakout rooms and Q and A's. Yeah, hi everyone. And uh, I'm sure you know me. Thank you, Mike, for the presentation. Uh, thanks. It's really interesting, actually, because we are working in the luxury travel industry and with a lot of high net worth individuals. And this is uh, an interesting uh, research on the jump up and their, their interest for luxury travel. 
So what we're going to be doing now is uh, you're going to be invited to go into one of the breakout rooms. And uh, during those breakout rooms, we're going to just uh, <clears throat> generate three questions per group. Okay, you're going to be put into a group. Please accept that invitation. And the way it's going to work, you're going to have a couple of minutes, uh, pr probably 10, 15 minutes to talk about, uh, within each other. If you don't know each other, get to know each other uh, in the connections way. We're always networking, so that's great. But uh, as you're having your discussions, what, what I would like you to come up with is three uh, questions for Mike, because we're going to come back and ask Mike those questions, or three uh, comments that you have about his presentation, especially on the on the notion of, of, uh, of targeting gem pop uh, uh, luxury travelers, potential luxury travelers. So that is the main topic for now. So just go ahead and join. When you come back, we will need three questions or three discussion points. Please choose a scribe between yourselves. So that person that uh, is chosen to be a scribe, when they come back to the to the main room, they will be asked to put in the chat the three questions or the three comments that you guys want to share with Mike. So if you should see a message in your uh, in your machine now, in your uh, in your uh, Zoom now, so just accept the uh, invitation. And I'll be joining you as well in those uh, breakout rooms and use this opportunity to get to know each other if you don't already know each other from the Connections community. Okay, so see you guys soon and uh, we'll, be, uh, we'll be in touch. So have a great discussion. Let's see everyone. Hello, everyone. OK, we're back. Thank you for uh, for uh, joining us. And thank you for having this little time together. Now we're back to the main room. I'm going to just be listening to some comments and questions first. But what I'm going to ask you now, you're going to hear some music uh, coming up, which uh, <laughs> is not my type of music, but is uh, it's a funky <laughs> type of music. I'm more old school. But you got to listen to that music. And whilst you hear that music, the scribe of each of the groups put their comments and questions on the chat. You guys ready to to scribe and also dance a bit if you want? <laughs> Jess, go for it. Hit it. Let's start. If you could put um, all, uh, Mike in the spotlight as well, Jess, if it's possible, so we could have a conversation. We have already some comments. We saw a couple of dances, Francisca a little bit, Valentina as well, you know, uh, as well. And obviously Charles was a star. He was a great dancer. So well done. Thank you for, for the bit of fun a bit. Okay, so um, Mike, I have a, there's a comment here from uh, Sarah. She says, usually in our experience is mostly the female members of a family planning the trips. Can you clarify a bit the bit uh, that you said about the men uh, uh, being the travelers? Can you can you can you clarify that bit? Is it the man planning, the man traveling, 
what is that? What 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 did you mean with that part of the presentation? Uh, that what yes, that was for so that population was for uh, travelers or intent. Uh, so travelers and future travelers, so not necessarily the planners, um, but the the people going on the trips. Uh, we do that. We do find that too. That in in a, a lot of travel, it is um, women that are doing a lot of the planning as well. And what 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 kind of uh traveler what what were you focusing on on general population or or uh, high net worth? In the in the general population, we do find that uh, find that to be true. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this you know this isn't to say that there aren't women in that uh, uh category that that were the most engaged. Uh, it's just that they do over index for having uh for being male. Um. You know, young uh, young women also, I think, believe generally fall into that one as well. They just do so kind of at the same same rates as uh, as they do in other segments. And, and interesting because you also mentioned uh, about uh, the fact of kids I maybe mean, uh, an important aspect of the gen population. So it's interesting to see that male travelers are looking into into planning things with kids as well. Can you can you? Uh... Uh, clarify this a bit because that, that's an interesting uh, uh, point. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, because we find that so many people who are interested in luxury travelers tend to be millennial age. Uh, we find that they kind of do just defaultly fall into parenthood because that's the sort of the, the prime generation for having um, kids at home living with them. So, you know, these are, are things that, you know, they'll have to think about is when they think of a vacation, they almost always kind of default to a, a family vacation. Um, but it is sort of important to know that even with those added costs and added logistical complexities, they are still considering um, luxury travel uh, for, for, for family vacations or even around them. Okay, cool, cool. All right. Um, excellent. So we have an another comment from Sarah. You were group one, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, could Ritz Carlton use a program like the STARS program to improve marketing of Bahrain to U.S. customers? I don't know if uh, Sarah, you could uh, clarify that a bit, if you could add her in the spotlight. Go ahead, Sarah. Yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, I believe that Michael uh, works for uh, Ritz Carlton, uh, and he had this question. So I would like maybe to ask him if he's still on um, oh. to answer that, because he he was saying that Bahrain actually is more popular with the European customers, and that's uh, the customer base that they're focusing on in Bahrain. Thank you, Sarah. You've done a great job so far. <laughs> and uh, thank you, Mike and David as well. Um, so uh, first of all, uh, commenting on uh, when you have mentioned that uh, Bahrain is uh, largely unknown for the US market. So I told the team uh, during our conversation uh, in room one that uh, I agree and disagree with this uh, uh, comment because first of all, uh, I, agree, I disagree because we have the one of the biggest uh, US Navy fleets in the Middle East here, the fifth fleet. Uh, so we have a lot of uh, uh, Americans coming to Bahrain and uh, uh, gladly when we offer the US per diem at our hotel, sometimes to, you know, to build a base, uh, they get a, a taste of luxury and they stay uh, with us and try and use our facilities. So we, we it's actually one of our biggest uh, feeder market uh, uh, just after uh, Saudi Arabia, which is in our neighboring country. Now, uh, uh, but on the other hand, uh, if we definitely we will not categorize the U.S. Uh, Navy uh, as part of the luxury travelers for sure, because uh, because of the uh, rate per diems and all this. So uh, this is where I agree with you that uh, Bahrain needs to uh, to do a lot of efforts to be able to you know penetrate the U.S. market. On uh, another uh, comment, where we uh, uh, obviously, uh, as a Ritz Cotton brand, we have uh, we are participating in the Stars program. So a Stars program is uh, like a network of high-end, ultra-premium uh, luxury travel agencies. 
and uh, it gives them uh, an additional added benefits when they book with us. Uh, I believe that uh, some of the attendees here will be familiar with this. So I was, uh, my question was, how can we utilize this program to really enhance uh, and, and push more traffic towards Bahrain uh, utilizing the uh, STARS program? I think remarketing efforts um, are are particularly uh, helpful. Um, you know, as as you look, is you know, um, it, you know, any rewards program, you're you're clearly more likely to be talking to high net worth. So I would say uh, marketing again along those lines of um, you know, memory making, the motivation of connecting with travelers. So. Uh, talking about multi-generational travel, uh, which uh, is is a growing, um, it's sort of a growing subsegment of travel in general, but also among luxury. I think that, uh, you know, existing uh, members, existing loyalty members, uh, you know, that of course is one of the most, one of the more powerful functions of a program is the ability to sort of directly remarket. So I think that um, you know, if you have the internal architecture and profiling of the behaviors and like where they've stayed, um, you know, perhaps mimicking uh, sort of, you know, like you, we we've seen that you've vacationed in in these areas. Here's similar ones. Bahrain is one of those similar ones. Um, doing that, uh, you know, you said partnering with advisors. Um, you know, if you have that sort of uh, previous uh, previous uh, execution by participation, rather, uh, by Ritz-Carlton guests, then, you know, you, again, you can see, well, they enjoyed, you know, this sort of, um, you know, touring through historical areas. You can tour, um, you know, the souks in Manama, uh, for instance, uh, you know, kind of linking the two, like some sort of like the that concierge facility. That uh, that hotels have through through the stars program. Right. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Michael. Let, let's go to the another question. And before we go, uh, talk a little bit um, uh, uh, more about uh, the Middle East. I uh, wanted to bring out one of the questions that Kelly Kelly uh, brought from her group, and that is focused on sustainability. You mentioned that sustainable travel is one of the deciding factors now for Gen Pop and uh, and high net worth individuals. Can you? Can you, um, uh, what does the current and future look like for re regenerative and sustainable travel to these destinations? Uh, what are they doing today and for the future? That's a question. I'm sorry, what are uh, some destinations doing? Yeah. Kelly? So a lot, so we're seeing in, in um, the luxury lodging and resorts space, a lot of sort of hyper locality so a lot of sourcing from either the property itself or the or nearby uh so um their food and beverage coming from local farms or from uh outlets that are nearby or even even on site um distilling their own spirits and, and what have you uh that's a that's a big one um you know a more sustainable electrical grid uh, as well, um, we I think we've come a long way in thinking uh, in in the lodging space specifically from just kind of getting rid of plastics to the actual um, ramifications of the supply chain and uh, you know, and as well as the materials on site. So I think that um, you know you'll be seeing more of these ideas of well, how do we get what we put in our property? And how can we shorten the supply chains, make those more sustainable as we see more uh, penetration of things like solar power uh, taking up more and more of, of, uh, of the power supply uh, for specific properties. Um, so yeah, definitely, definitely the supply chain. Um, and, uh, but, you know, then for the, the challenge then is connecting the ideas of supply chain, which is a very, you know, it's something that's top of mind for, for uh, companies and translating that into something that the consumer can understand. Um, so, you know, how, how do we say we have a sustainable supply chain in a way that someone who's visiting would be able to comprehend and, and be drawn to? 
So, the, but but that definitely is uh, something very important for for the travelers. And now now it's in front of mind, as probably pre pandemic wasn't, but now it's pretty definitely in front of mind. And um, yeah. just, uh, to let everyone know that we will be sharing afterwards the uh, presentation. So any more further questions, uh, uh, Mike will be happy to to help, uh, or maybe we'll go out to our network if there's a specific uh, subject that we could help you with, like the tourist board uh, question. We could definitely put you in contact with tourist boards, and and um, we're happy to to connect you with that. And uh, before we go for our last question, uh, I just wanted to uh, touch on the base uh, on the question that Sarah put of how important are external factors like geopolitical events influencing the travel decisions of both jump up and high net worth. How, how important is that, especially for the jump up and high net worth uh, uh, population, Mike? You know, the, they're very important. Um, we know that safety is a very um, kind of top of mind concern with travelers in general. Uh, we just finished looking at a report on solo travelers and safety was their number one barrier uh, to going on a trip by themselves. So, being able to assuage a lot of fears about personal safety, about the safety of belongings, about being able to get around, that's a huge factor, um, you know, and and especially it's, it's challenging because, uh, you know, all of these, when we're talking about, uh, you know, especially like American and Canadian travelers, because destinations like Bahrain are so far and we can, travel to either, you know, topographically similar or um, more or places that are more kind of culturally connected to us. Um, so like European destinations uh, or tropical destinations are even easier. So I think that um, you really have to put in more work to really kind of assuage fears of that. Um, like I remember uh, my honeymoon was in Turkey some 10 years ago. And people were asking, oh, what if this this uh, event that's happening in this country? And, and, and I'm like, that's way far away. That's like asking someone in San Diego what you think is happening in Montreal. It's, you know, th th it's that kind of also, you know, unfamiliarity with ge geography and, and how things are, are the nuances different. Um, and, and that's, that form of education is, is really important. And, I think really is is vital turning that that push of an unfamiliar culture into a pull factor. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Mike, for, uh, for that. Again, guys, we'll be sharing. Uh, we will be sharing the presentation with everyone. Uh, look out for your emails and and uh, communications through Grip. That's the system that we're uh, using. I'm going to give the word uh, to Angelo again. We're wrapping up because we're we're about to start the next meeting. So, thank you, Mike, and uh, over to you, Angelo. Yes, thank you so much, Mike, for sharing your um, knowledge with us today. As uh, my colleague David said, we will be sharing uh, the recorded Connect Talks with you in the upcoming days. Um, now, obviously, remember that at 5 p.m. UK time, we will continue with the Connections virtual one-to-one -one meetings. Uh, so please make sure you refer to your diary and uh, join um, at 5 p.m. Thank you so much again for joining us today, and uh, we look forward to seeing you all in our next um, event, either virtual or physical. Uh, please, please feel free to end this call and take care. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Bye, guys. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye-bye.